High Adventure. Tonight's story by Ron Evans is entitled The Blockade Runners. Is that a message coming through from Q section? Yes, sir. It's red urgent. Shall I take it to the decoding room, sir? Uh, no, I'll attend to it myself, thanks. Let me know the minute anything else comes through. Come in. Red Urgent from Q section, sir. Blast! I know what it is before you tell me, Fuchs. They're bottled in south of Orosund. I'm afraid so, sir. Jerry spotted them. Well, there's nothing we can do to help them. If I were in Commander Robert's shoes, I'd try to make a run for it, under cover of nightfall. Well, the sound is completely covered by German e-boats and searchlights, sir. I doubt if even a piece of driftwood could pass them unseen. We can't just write off six motor torpedo boats, Lieutenant Fuchs. I can only advise Roberts to use his own initiative and stress the importance of getting home with those ball bearings. Ah... The run to Sweden's developed into a suicide mission the last few months since the Germans occupied Denmark. But we have to get the goods from Sweden regardless of the cost. We lost seven out of nine boats last time, sir. You don't have to remind me of that, man. Look, uh, signal Roberts. Tell him he must break through that blockade somehow. Signal to Commander Roberts. Break through German blockade at all costs. That was the message I relayed to Commander Roberts that afternoon. In those early days of the war, I was a lieutenant attached to the Admiralty Operations Room in London. To us, safe in our underground bunker, it was like playing war with plastic men and ships. But at night, I often lay back in my bed and wondered how it really was out there, on the receiving end of our signals. That's why I've reconstructed the story of Commander Roberts and his tiny fleet of six motor torpedo boats. It was vital for Britain's industries in those dark days to get an ample supply of ball bearings from Sweden, the only neutral country able to supply them in sufficient quantities. After the Germans had occupied Denmark and Norway, Sweden was virtually cut off from the free world, apart from the narrow straits called Oresund which run north to south between Denmark and Sweden. Knowing the importance of these supplies, the Germans blockaded the strait and heavily patrolled the Kattegat north of there. At first, fast MTBs had been the answer, but now casualties were running as high as 80%. While plans were afoot to find an alternative method, Commander Roberts had been put in charge of making what was promised to be the last run for some time to come. The MTBs had been stripped of their weapons, except for a gun in the bow and two machine guns on each side of the bridge. While this made them lighter, it put them at the mercy of any enemy vessel in a close encounter. Their big advantage was speed, which was in excess of 45 knots, and the drill was never to allow an enemy to come close. However, this wasn't possible during the race up Orosund, where the small boats often came as close as a 100 yards from the enemy's gunfire. Commander Roberts was on the narrow bridge of M34 when the Sparks handed him my signal. The flotilla was heaved to some ten miles off the southern coast of Sweden, the small boats heaving and pitching in the gentle shore swell. Ah, so operations say I'm to use my own initiative, eh? Pass the buck to the man on the spot. (laughs) Typical of their lordships. Still, there's not much they can do to help us, I suppose. Here we sit like six wild ducks waiting for the hunters to open fire. You know, it's strange why Jerry hasn't tried to hunt us down, sir. Is it, Lieutenant? He knows he can't catch us in open water, so why should he try when he knows we have to make a run sooner or later through Orisund? Well, either that or return to Sweden, which to my mind is out of the question. 
Our Swedish contact, who's keeping an eye on Orison from his side, says it's so heavily patrolled that we'd be unlikely to survive the first couple of miles. Let alone the 50 we'd have to run before we get back into open water. Uh, they're making sure of us this time. The way I see it, sir, our only hope is to race through at full speed under cover of darkness. That's what they hope we'll do. But I'm told they've got searchlights along 30 miles of coastline that'll pick us out like olives in a jar. No, we've four hours of daylight left in which to think. So let's think, Lieutenant. Planes, sir. Three of them. Jerry's. Sound action stations. Just probably to keep us on our toes and warn us of things to come. as I see. Signal the other ships to use anti-dive bombing tactics. Aye, aye, sir. Off the head engines. The black-painted German Stuka dive bombers flew once over the flotilla, banked and turned, and then the first one dived just as the MTBs scattered in different directions. Each of the Stukas made three runs before veering off back towards the Danish coast. One had black smoke billowing from its engine. Ten minutes later, the six MTBs were again clustered within hailing distance of each other. None had suffered damage or casualties. Must be training pilots and using us as targets. We hit one of the Stukas, sir. Yes, but not hard enough. Well, Lieutenant, let's go into my cabin and think over our problem. I've got some whiskey here. You'd like a dram? Aye, sir. I would. Uh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Let's drink to a successful night's work. Heaven knows what we're going to do, but we'll do it, huh? Here's to success, sir. <clears throat> my, that takes some of the cold out of my bones. Uh, pass me that chart, if you please, Mr. Maynard. Uh, no, not that one. Uh, the nest. Yes. But uh, that's the Long Island one, sir. I know. But we can't use that route, sir. It, it's like... Well, it's like sailing through the middle of Denmark, so to speak. <laughs> well, I hope the Germans think like you do. Oh, man, don't be like them. Use your imagination. Would you expect us to do a silly thing like that? No, of course not, sir. But never the... No le buts, Lieutenant. That's the very reason why it's the logical thing to do. It would work once and once only. But isn't that all we need? Yes, I see what you mean, sir. It's a 250-mile run. That's five times longer than going through Orosant, I'll admit. Six and a half hours and all under cover of darkness. 2100 to 0330 hours. And with only a tenth of the risk. Perhaps the strait between Long Island and Lolland is patrolled, sir. I doubt it, judging from the state of the Orosant blockade. I'd say they've moved just about everything they can up there to stop us. Yes. I think the five ships will easily make it home. <clears throat> Six ships, sir. We shan't be going that way, Lieutenant. While the others do it, we shall be trying to force the Orison blockade. Sir? I'd like to know how strong it is for future reference and also to create a diversion. Not married, are you, Lieutenant? Uh, no, sir. Ah, a bachelor like me, good. M-34 will be crewed by single men, all volunteers. You can arrange that later. Uh, I take it you will volunteer to accompany us, Lieutenant Maynard? I'm uh, shaking all over, sir, but yes, right into the jaws of hell itself. What an excellent description of our destination. Commander Roberts knew that to send all the MTBs past the island of Langeland and through the Sturb Bait might give the Germans time to cross the Kattegat to intercept. He was sure that during the hours of daylight they were under constant aerial observation. But at night it was possible for one ship to bluff the opposition. Create so much confusion that perhaps the Germans would think all the British MTBs were trying to break the blockade. That way they would pay little attention to the Langeland route. 
That is, if they ever thought the British to be cheeky enough to try that route anyway. During the remaining daylight hours, orders were given. Single volunteers boarded M34 to replace the married crew members. Just before twilight set in, the six ships sailed line abreast at half speed towards Oresund. High above their heads, a German reconnaissance plane peeled off to the west to report their maneuver. M34 could expect a very hot reception. It was a cloudy, starless night, and on a prearranged signal, the five MTBs turned their bows to the southwest with only the dull roar of their powerful motors to identify them. As for M34, she kept her original course straight for the narrowing waters of Oresund. An hour passed. On the starboard side, the men could see the lights of the Swedish seaport of Malmo. We can always make a run for Malmo if it gets too rough, sir. Not on your life, and spend the rest of the war interned. Besides, the Swedes put out harbour booms at night, and Jerry will have a few boats patrolling over there too, believe me. Ah, look, there's the first searchlights we were warned about. Yes, sir. Full ahead. Right, sir. This is where we have to keep them guessing, Lieutenant. All along the length of the Danish coastline, the sharp beams of searchlight scanned the water. From the eastern side came more beams. Searchlights had been fitted to the numerous German patrol boats which guarded the Swedish side of Oresund. M34 changed her course, now at full speed, and headed first at the Danish coast, made a sharp turn, and started to zigzag. As she evaded the beam of one searchlight, so she was picked up by another. This is what Commander Roberts had hoped for, since each searchlight would report a sighting, and the more the confusion. Then the German shore batteries opened up. M-34's maneuverability and speed served her well. Plumes of water appeared far astern as the shore batteries tried to work out her speed and direction. The zigzag pattern was changed by the minute, and the men relieved their tension by shouting insults at the enemy gunners. Now on the port side could be seen the few lights of the normally blacked-out city of Copenhagen. From here, the sound would narrow from its present nine miles to only three. As they ran the gauntlet of gunfire northward, Commander Roberts grew puzzled. This is too easy, Maynard. That's just what I was thinking, sir. Where are all the Jerry patrol boats, eh? The few we've seen are keeping their distance. Perhaps they're saving us for the coup de grace at the sound's narrowest point, sir. <laughs> yes, by Jove, that's it. And I'll bet they're closing off the southern end of the sound by now, too. We'll be well and truly caught in, eh? Yes, sir. Oh, well, not to worry, Lieutenant. We're not dead yet. Lights ahead, sir! Yes, sir. Look! Right across the sound from side to side, a barrier of patrol boats. Well, well. I think they were trying to repel an invasion. The, the shore batteries are closing down, I see. Knowing what lousy shots they are, no doubt they're scared of hitting their own vessels. How far to the barrier, do you reckon? Oh, three miles at the most, sir. I agree. Very well, we can stop our zigzag pattern. And then, sir? Up and at them, laddie. Let's hit that barrier like an avenging fury. Commander Roberts peered through his binoculars at the line of lights ahead, searching for an opening. The greatest danger lay in whether the Germans thought to drop log booms between the ships. If M-34 were to hit one at her present speed, it would mean almost certain destruction. Searchlights mounted on the bow of the blockade ships picked them out, and medium and light weapons opened up. Keep your head down, Maynard. It's too early yet to have it blown off. Helmsman, three degrees to port. Three degrees to port, sir. Damn, I wish I could see more clearly. Ah, yes. Look over there, Lieutenant. Between those e-boats and the minesweeper, you see it? Yes, sir. About 50 feet. Not very wide, sir. Well, that's all we've got, so pray Jerry hasn't lowered a boom there. Tell the gunners to open up on both sides just as we approach the gap. Aye, aye, sir. 
Their aim's improving, helmsman. Go help the gunners. I'll take the wheel. The air was filled with hissing, angry metal and spray from the choppy sea. Several of the blockade vessels fired off flares, for which Commander Roberts was thankful. It assisted him to assess the situation. A German e-boat, at the last minute realizing his intention, tried to move out and close the gap. Sir, the gap's being closed. Then we'll open it up again. Hold tight, we're going in. Robert swung hard on the wheel, and the small boat zipped into the gap, her machine guns blazing out defiance from both sides. He swung the wheel again to avoid colliding with the German e-boat, and M34 slid along the side of the minesweeper, much to the astonishment of the German sailors above. For a moment it seemed as though they were clear. However, a fast-thinking German e-boat skipper had backed off and was in the act of bringing his boat under the minesweeper's stern. We've hit her, sir. Yeah, it's all right. Our engines still respond. The stunned crew of the sinking German e-boat were throwing themselves over the side as M34 backed off. Then Commander Roberts put his engines back to full ahead and raced clear. We're through. We've cleared the blockade, sir. So I see, Lieutenant. And nothing's there to catch us now. <laughs> we might even get home before the others. <laughs> That'll produce a few raised eyebrows in the Admiralty, sir. What is it, engine room? We're shipping water, sir, by the tubful. Oh, no. To every silver lining there has to be a cloud. Can your pumps cope? Oh, there's no hope of that, sir. Unless we can reduce speed, we've only got minutes before the place is flooded. Very well. Reduce the half speed and keep pumping for as long as you can. Did you hear that? I did, sir. We're never going to get away at half speed. Jerry's e-boats will be after us any minute now, sir. Well, I'll gamble that they're still in a state of confusion back there. Uh, are we... Uh, are we going back, sir? We need a new boat, Lieutenant, and Jerry's got plenty of them. Arm the men and tell them to prepare to board when I find a likely victim. Their S-57s are the fastest, and only eight in the crew. One of them is our best bet, I think. Now hurry, man, we've only got minutes. Aye, aye, sir. While M-34 bore back down on the blockade ships, the bemused Lieutenant gave out his instructions to the ten-man crew, at the same time issuing them with small arms. Roberts steered along the line of blockade ships, and not a shot was fired. It was obvious that the Germans mistook M-34 for one of their own. He watched the silhouette and position of each vessel, seeking an S-57 torpedo boat. Most of the enemy E-boats were already turning to pursue the elusive British boat, which they assumed was now racing at full speed into the Kattegat and safety. We're going to have to abandon the engine room, sir. Uh, look, we need just a few more minutes. Hold out down there as long as you can. Engine room say they've only got a minute or two, sir. There's an S-57 over there, Lieutenant. You see it? Yes. He's just starting up his engines. The whole blockade is virtually broken up to chase us. <laughs> if they only knew we're right here under their noses. Look, I'm going to slam right alongside. You go over with your boarding party the moment we hit. In true Nelson style, sir? Prisoners? You shouldn't have asked me that, Lieutenant. Because I'm now bound by the rules of war to say yes. Anyway, a couple of prisoners may come in useful later. Avoid shooting where possible. Knives, bayonets and cutlasses are quieter. Very good, sir. Hurry, man. You've less than a minute. Roberts pointed his bow at the S-57 and reduced speed. As he drew closer, he could see men on the deck of the German e-boat, looking towards him in the glare of the bow searchlight, which Lieutenant Maynard had switched on. At the last moment before impact, he turned the wheel sharply to port, and as the bow swung left, the side of M-34 struck with a large crunch. The British seaman leapt aboard the German ship and scattered, each seeking a victim of his own. It was over in a minute, without one single shot being fired. Then the S-57 slowly moved forward, turned, and gently came alongside the British ship, 
which was now wallowing in the light swell. Commander Roberts and the engine room crew were taken off, and all hands watched sadly as their tiny ship disappeared astern in the darkness, abandoned. All right, well, that was a quick change, Lieutenant. But it's sad to see her go like that, isn't it? Yes, sir. When the Germans find her, won't it give our game away, sir? No, the water's coming in so fast that she'll go under in the next half hour. Any prisoners? Well, the German captain and radio operator are all in one piece, sir. There are two others wounded. We put them down below with Miller guarding them. Send the captain up here to me on the bridge. I want to have a chat with him. Uh, but I can assure you, Captain Sturmfeger, this was not a trick. And you can protest all you like, but you're still coming with us back to England. You think I will be a prisoner for long? Hmm? Our other ships will soon get suspicious when you do not answer the call sign. I see. Well, you'd better tell me your call sign so that we can reply. <laughs> Never. Look, I'm trying to be reasonable, but you must realize that we are desperate men. I didn't have to take you prisoner, you know. You could quite easily have been drifting down the Orison by now like a chuck of fish baits. Yeah, but I am a prisoner now. Captain Sturmfeger, I'll be more than frank with you. Unless you and your radio operator cooperate, I can see no future for either of you aboard this vessel. And the water outside there is quite chilly. Do you understand? You are threatening me? I would have thought that was quite clear. Your only hope of survival is to save with us to England. <laughs> you are married, perhaps? Yeah. Surely you want to see your wife again? Do you have any children? Yeah, I have three. Well, the war won't last forever, you know. Our call signal is KLZ-3412. We are called every hour on the hour by our depot ship, Salzbergen. Her call signal is NLG-321. If you bring up Steiner, my radio operator, he will assist you. He has five children. Yes. Family men can be most vulnerable in times of war. Commander Roberts's plan worked perfectly. The prisoners resigned themselves to their inevitable fate in a prisoner of war camp. Roberts slipped past several of the German search vessels and even flashed friendly messages. When daylight came, it was as though they had the Kattegat to themselves. The sun shone brightly, and the water was calm. Our other ships shouldn't be too far away, sir. Couldn't we call them up on the radio? No, I don't want to break radio silence yet. I'm on a course now that should cross their path. Did you say other ships? What other ships? The rest of our flotilla, of course. But did not, did not all your ships, six of them, try to break to our blockade? Didn't you know? We were on our own. What? The others are coming round by Long Island route. <laughs> I bet you had so many ships on Orison that you left none to guard Sturbeck, eh? Oh, don't look so unhappy, Captain Stemfeger. Let's go down below and have a noggin or two of that nice French cognac of yours. It's not your fault that you're on the wrong side, is it? Shortly after lunch, the watch sighted five small ships on the horizon and coming up fast. Commander Roberts hurried up onto the deck at Maynard's call. Good lads. See the way they're spreading out? Oh, by Jove, I think they're going to attack us. That's the spirit, lads. Five against one, eh? Irresistible odds. What do you think, Lieutenant? <laughs> Hardly heroic, sir. Only fools are heroes in times of war. Uh, yes, sir. Have the signalman take down our German recognition flags and tell him to replace them with this message. Uh, yes, sir. Are you sure you want this hoisting, sir? Well, it tells the story, doesn't it? 
The sound of klaxons on the five MTBs were quickly replaced by loud cheers when the men read the signal which fluttered at the masthead. Sorry, too late, chaps. Roberts, Commander, Royal Navy. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.